Welcome to Sex is Medicine, your number one resource for holistic sex education. I'm Davy Ward Erickson, and I invite you to join me every week for another enriching and powerful conversation about the intersection of sexuality, spirituality, pleasure, and personal growth. Each episode of Sex is Medicine is dedicated to awakening your heart and mind to the true purpose and power of human sexuality. Please join me on this journey of self-discovery as we explore the art of using pleasure as medicine to awaken, heal, and empower every area of your life. Sex is Medicine broadcasts every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Contact Talk Radio Network. You can listen to the replay and subscribe to Sex is Medicine on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And now get ready for another episode of Sex is Medicine. Hey everybody, welcome to Sex is Medicine. I am your host, Davy Ward Erickson, and I am delighted to be here with you for another episode where we explore the intersection of sexuality, spirituality, pleasure, and personal growth. I am very excited about our guest this evening, this Heather Bartos, Dr. Heather Bartos, and we're going to talk about your brain on sex this evening. We're going to talk about neuroplasticity and healing and brains and orgasms and all that awesome stuff. And Heather is a board certified OBGYN, author, speaker, mom, and everyday gal pal. Dr. Heather Bartos is a leading voice in the field of women's health and particularly women's sexual health. She is also a U.S. Navy veteran. Woo, woo, woo. (laughs) <laughs> former associate professor of OBGYN and is currently medical director of her village for women's health. Wonderful. Women's health and wellness outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, she's been featured in publications from Glamour and Huffington Post to Reader's Digest, Women's Health and ABC News. Dr. Bartos loves talking about all things women and sex on her podcast, The Me Spot. Wanted to give a shout out to your podcast, The Me Spot. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here, Heather. It is an honor and a delight. I am so excited. We've been having so much fun. My face hurts already from laughing. <laughs> so the, the the behind the scenes edits are the ones that you guys want to see someday. <laughs> yes, the the bloopers, the blooper reel is going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the brain and sex. Why why is this such a, a target for you? A point of focus for you? Yeah, you know it's funny because everyone assumes I'm a gynecologist, so all I deal with all day are the vaginas, right? Like they're like, that's it. Vaginas, the cooter, the hooch, whatever we're going to call it. And, and so when I started working in the sexual health field, which really, you know, it's been about seven years and it started with a woman in her seventies who after her well woman said, she goes, I have to ask you a question. And I'm thinking, Oh, homegirl's going to need a refill or something. I'm like, what you got? She goes, I don't know if I've ever had an orgasm and my mouth like did, you know, Ah, uh, you know, like a little wooga. And, but of course, I had to keep, you know, professional. So I was like, oh, why do you think that? And it turned out that she had just never experienced an orgasm at 70, age 70. I was my mother's age at the time. And I all of a sudden started realizing all these women are lacking a full, satisfying sexual life. And when I started talking to her about it, it wasn't that she didn't know how to use the equipment. It was that she couldn't get her brain to get to the next level. She couldn't drop her guard down to really let her husband pleasure her. So and that hypervigilance. I, yes, that hyper-vigilance. yes. I mean, she yeah. just she just thought I have to pleasure. I have to. He's the one that gets the pleasure, and I'm just going to receive. And so we started working on just through natural conversation on her brain. I said, mm-hmm. "Sister, your brain is mm-hmm. holding back from." all of this amazing uh, sweetness that's going to come that naturally should come to you in life. And we started working on this and I saw this huge shift in her Mm -hmm. and it was something very simple, but it just was something that she had grown up with. And I started realizing over and over the brain is really our biggest sex organ as women. And it's fucking us up a lot of times because we're all about go, go, go to do, to do, to do. And we're never like, Hey, and you know, this Davey relaxing, accepting, giving, receiving, and, and the brain is a huge reason that we're not getting there. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is, is our cultural conditioning 
in relationship to sex. So particularly for this older generation, right? The boomer generation and how rooted yeah. in like, you know, this patriarchal, like, rawr, like conditioning, like, like our vaginas are for their pleasure, right? It's not for our yes. pleasure, it's yes. for their pleasure. So pre-feminism kind of concepts around sexuality and how that really, it's literally a mind fuck. Like it literally prevents us from being able to relax and receive pleasure. And then if we layer on top of that religious conditioning, which is where most of our cultural mm -hmm. conditioning around sex comes from, that purity yep. culture, that you know, belief that pleasure is sinful, it literally becomes an orgasm block in our own brains. It becomes, I mean, it blocks everything, the libido, the drive, the, the lubrication. And, you know, when I started watching, and I'm sure you've seen Mad Men, right? I mean, it's a great series. And you see how women there are are so dichotomous. You know, there's either Betty Draper, who's the, the very chaste housewife that doesn't do anything. And then he has all of his set of what we'll call just whores, for lack of a better word, for his his idea. And, and this is how women in this decade were treated. But then I started seeing it trickling down to different decades because those mothers brought it down to the next level and then brought it down to the next level. And it just perpetuated through the generations. And it's not even like our parents were trying to fuck us up with this. It just was pure conditioning. Yes, exactly. And, and the, that, that, that uh, transference of generational trauma, right? How, how these traumatic exactly. imprints, they're passed down genetically, but they're also uh, passed down socially and relationally, the rules and the yeah. guidelines and what's appropriate and inappropriate and how much pleasure we uh, were allowed to receive. And what's amazing is that those beliefs are set by age eight. Dude, tell me and about that. None of us. So our, our, our DNA beliefs about what is appropriate, culturally appropriate, our mindset beliefs about most things, but sex included, are cemented between ages five and eight. Wow. So before you even know what sex is, you've already been taught a shitload about what sex is. And a lot of times this happens because, you know, you may be touching yourself, which is a normal developmental thing for most young women and men too, um, for girls and mom or someone catches you and says, that's dirty. Don't touch that down there. Yep. And these little messages start coming up or, you know, you need to go kiss uncle Albert before he leaves. You know, it becomes this like almost a grooming process. Yeah. And, and before age eight, I, I didn't see a penis till I was almost 19. You know, so before you ever knew what was going on, you were already being taught what your parents thought was appropriate sexually. And what blows my mind about that is it's it, it gets ingrained in our subconscious, right? So it's not like, so later on, let's say I'm 25 years old and I feel guilty about masturbating. I don't consciously know where that came from. It's just like, I just know inherently in my soul that it's a dirty, nasty thing to do. So these yes. messages are literally programmed into our brains from birth. And then they're, as you're saying, anchored in and cemented by age eight. And so I'm thinking of my mind goes to like circumcision, infant male circumcision, which is yes. sexual violence, um, yes. any type of childhood sexual trauma. I had my first experience of, you know, sexual trauma around the age, between the ages of three and five. So we're being informed from our environment in really negative ways, whether we have concrete traumas or whether it's just part of the world that we live in, the information that we're receiving from our environment around sex is often rooted in trauma and ignorance. And, and, you know, the trauma, you're exactly right. And the trauma can be a big trauma, like a sexual abuse situation. And they can also be these little baby traumas that just kind of accumulate. And we often call those little T's and they're not diminished compared to the big T's, but they're more insidious because they just kind of get pushed into your psyche and without you even knowing. I mean, you knew, you know, when you were a young girl that that was wrong, but, but you may not have known that those little comments, those little comments about your breasts that were coming up and all those things were also traumas. Yeah. And so it's just a whole shitload of stuff we're loaded with before we ever get to puberty. So implanted or established by eight years old, then we grow up and we're teenagers and we still don't receive any sex education, pleasure-based sex education. We just learned that it's still a dirty sin and don't get pregnant. And oh my God, you can get sores and have, you know, your genitals. <laughs> with the pictures that they show us. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> oh my God. This is your genitals on syphilis. This is your genitals. Yes. On, you know, <laughs> on 
untreated herpes. I mean, my God. So it's like a horror show. That's our sex education. It actually becomes like a horror yes. show, which further traumatizes us. And then we are supposed to, you know, get married because again, according to the old world view, that's the only safe container to have sex. And then we show up into the bedroom and we wonder why we're frozen. Yeah. Yeah. But we know nothing. I mean, we literally know nothing. And, you know, and, and I, I've, I'm thinking about a time when, when I was about 15 or 16 and I asked my mom, I like to, I like to push her. I like to test her a lot. Um, she will confirm that for you. I was a very pushing child. And, and I said, I said, what would you do if I hurt, if I, if I hurt somebody? She said, well, of course, you know, we would love you. I said, what if I, what if I killed somebody? She said, well, we would always love you. And I said, what if I got pregnant? And there was a pause. And she said, well, we'd be very disappointed in you, but we would still love you. I remember thinking, Fuck, I'm not getting pregnant up shit. I mean, she's okay with me killing somebody, but getting knocked up was not an option. And so I literally personally really just kind of shied away from all that for a long time because I had so much guilt around even thinking I should have some kind of pleasure with sex. And it's just those little comments. Those little yeah. con- and she doesn't remember this comment at all. She doesn't remember this conversation, but I sure do. But I you mean, do. And that's what and but I do. imprinted you, right? And so that that, yeah. that really speaks to truly the, this larger societal issue, which is violence is acceptable and even condoned. Right. A movie that shows like I'm I, I don't watch television like normal television. I watch stuff online. Right. And I'm still I'm flabbergasted at the fact that that a show or a movie will be rated PG-13 when people are mowing each other down with AK-47s like that's PG-13. Yep. But if you show a nipple on a breast it's going to be rated R and C 17. And that that literally yes. is like that little experience you had with your mom really encapsulates the cultural relationship with sex is killing is oh. fine. Violence is okay. But if you do what you want with your vagina, Heather. Yes. If you, if you have sex, cause the boy's probably not going to get in trouble. No one's gonna be disappointed in the boy, but no, you, no you get a reputation of being awesome. Right. And I'll be, I'll be the girl that got not, and my parents will be disappointed. And there's nothing worse than disappointment from your parents. I mean, like, oh. that's like, uh, like the worst. And this kind of shit goes on and on and on, even up into adulthood. And this is really what's blocking a lot of our ability to then let go in the bedroom, which is why things like Tantra are great because they really focus on releasing that part. Mm-hmm. And so all this stuff is, you mentioned the prefrontal cortex is, is that where all of this stuff kind of all these, like uh, this, view of of sex is scary and like us separate from it is is that lodged in the prefrontal cor- cortex yeah you know and, and and no one can see us but we're both we're both holding the front of our heads <laughs> like we have headaches right now but yes it's always kind of like i would say it's kind of right in the front and this is our this is our thinking i gotta do this uh this is our logical part of our brain that's really kind of grown up right from where the where we were as as, as monkeys and before and then down in our limbic system is where the animal part of us is it's food it's sex it's it's all the kind of the basics for kind of human survival and that's the part that we want to be active during sex i always ask them and i'm like what do you think about during sex and they said oh i well i'm thinking i go wrong (laughs) you shouldn't be thinking during sex trick question you're supposed to be feeling during sex and so when women tell me I'm doing my target shopping list or I'm doing this, I'm like, you're in the wrong part of your brain, sister. And that's where we have to get them out and back into the limbic brain, which is further down, further back in and, and really get to that animal instinct. Mm-hmm. And so, um, the, <laughs> You just blew my mind, Heather. Oh my God, my prefrontal cortex. <laughs> So, so I've seen, um, and you've probably seen these MRI images online of what's yes. happening in the brain during orgasm. So if I'm remembering, yes. right, it's the prefrontal cortex that shuts down during orgasm it and then it's like all these down. other areas come online. So that makes yep. a lot of sense. And if we're so hooked into that processing, that, that intellectual functioning of the mind, then we aren't able to let go into orgasm, that it literally becomes a block to experiencing that pleasure because that is the part that we actually have to let go of in order to orgasm. Yeah, you literally like have to lose your mind essentially to have great sex. And, you know, and, and women were real, we are really prone to it as women 
because, you know, we're like, oh gosh, do I look fat in this? What is he thinking right now? Do I smell bad? What do I taste like? Uh, And we start asking a thousand questions that mean you ain't not in the right place. You got to be, forget all that. And I usually will tell women, I want you just to focus on your five senses. That's it. Like smell your partner, lick your partner, you know, uh, look at your partner, get into the the five senses and it's going to take you out of thinking because the thinking is just fucking it up. Yeah. So come back to the body. That's the key. And so, yes, in Tantra, we have meditation. Yeah. This is why we call debate. Yes. Before we even talk about sex, let's let's just get you present with your body before we talk about anything sexual. Right. right. Can you follow 21 breaths? Let's find out. Right. So- and, and a lot of people cannot. Right. Yeah. They cannot. And because we are as a society are go, 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 go. Exactly. We and are that. That's why we're not having great orgasms when we can't get out of our heads. You can't get out of your heads. And then there's these wonderful things called mirror neurons. And do you guys work with that in Tantra where you literally can mirror your partner and you actually can feel what they're feeling. And so the brain is remarkable when it comes to this and what its capacity to feel and kind of experience is. But if, like I said, if you're doing your target shopping list while you're having sex, you ain't in the right place. So let's talk a bit more about the mirror neurons because my yeah. the way I think of it and the way we teach it, because this, this conversation about mirror neurons is relatively recent in the, in the, in the yes. dialogue. And previous to that, my understanding was more about synchronizing our nervous systems. So I know yes. that when two or more people breathe together at the same rate and the same pace, their heartbeat synchronize. And if they're touching their brainwave patterns will synchronize. And so when we're talking about meditative practices, this is really beneficial because when I meditate, my brainwave patterns go from the beta to the uh-huh. alpha to the theta, right? And then the right and the left yep. hemisphere harmonize. So if I've got this groovy flow going on in my brain and then I touch you and we're synchronizing our breath, then we re- we literally entrain each other's brainwave patterns to be this really fluid, sensual, delicious experience. Exactly. Exactly. And you and you and I've been doing this back and forth because we, we're both smiling at each other and our eyes get real big and we're really excited. And that's the mirror neurons that they're basic. You know, we're just vibing off each other's energy right now. We got the same big old smile. No one can again can see this. She looks better they than I do YouTube. right now. They can on YouTube. <laughs> oh, they can <laughs> on YouTube. On YouTube.com. And, and, <laughs> YouTube. and you know, and so we're we're and if people are watching, they're really seeing that we're kind of mimicking each other a little bit right now. And when you smile at someone and they smile back those are some of those mirror neurons at their most basic level but you're right when you get into that with a partner and you start just breathing together that's what we do with babies when we put them skin to skin we're literally just kind of coordinating our nervous systems to work together in training and it's awesome because it secretes oxytocin which is the bonding hormone really pronounced after orgasm dopamine all this good stuff yeah, all the all the things that make life worth living. And then the, the way this to me, I'm always thinking about like, well, having great sex is wonderful. But what does that mean for the rest of my life? So if our bodies are full of oxytocin, we're going to bond not just with our partner, but the rest of our family and the rest of our community. Dopamine, yeah. I'm going to feel creative and inspired. Serotonin, I'm going to feel relaxed and at ease. Endorphins, I'm going to have energy and my body's going to feel good and it's going to reduce inflammation. So what yeah. your orgasm does, it impacts your world because you're happy. <laughs> and you feel yes. it in your body. <laughs> well, and, and you think about like, you know, addiction to a lot of different things, alcohol, sex, chemicals. It's all about the dopamine hit, right? Same thing. Sugar does the same thing to us. It makes us go. Whoo, and we feel it. So, so sex and dopamine. Oh, wait, we don't have to eat as much anymore. We don't drink as much anymore. You know, and if we start getting our serotonin up, that's all antidepressants do is they just help us uptake our own serotonin. Mm. But what if you don't have to spend money on Lexapro every month, but instead you're giving it off yourself. We're supposed to not have to be on antidepressants for 20 years. We're supposed to be able to create that for ourselves. Yeah. And so I love that. And so, so let's talk about neuroplasticity because one of the primary causes of depression is trauma, is unresolved trauma because of what it does to the brain and how it affects yes. the chemical balance of the brain and the limbic system and the gray and white matter and all of that stuff. And so neuroplasticity is a science of essentially healing and rewiring the brain. 
Absolutely. And I think it's so fucking phenomenal that that the brain is so intelligent. I mean, this isn't any old computer. This is this is like nature's best computer that you can literally rewire every kind of not functioning the best kind of little little synapse and rewire it to be the best thing it can be for you. And how do we go about doing that rewiring from your standpoint? Because we have our own practices around rewiring, but from your point of view, how do we go about rewiring, yeah. particularly these these literal cock blocks <laughs> that are yes. given to us by the time we're yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and part of what I start with, with, with some of my patients is, is let's identify what some of those are. And I'll usually have them just kind of keep on their phone or whatever's handy. Uh, their little kind of on their note section, like their little traumas that they come up with, because you're not going to think if I sit there and go, what are all your traumas? You're like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But they'll come to you, right? They'll come to you at 4am. They'll come to you while you're sitting on the crap or they'll come to you all these weird times. And so I say, just keep that handy and write it down. It doesn't have to be a complete thought. It can just be, you know, Uncle Fred or, you know, mom caught me at six, these different little things and start bringing them up into the consciousness and they'll start bringing more up into the consciousness because it kind of what stirs up, stirs up. And then we start releasing those things. We start releasing them out. We realize that they're not ideas that serve us Mm -hmm. and we start rewriting our script. And so I always ask women, I'm like, what is the sex life that you want? What is that? What does that look like to you? That's what I want you to meditate on when you're thinking and meditate on it while you're masturbating. I mean, that's just kind of the overall vibe that you want to start putting out there. And I'll tell them and start, start looking at other women as sexy. Who are the sexy women that you see? Who are the sexy men? Why do they feel sexy to you? Probably because they're, they look free. They look happy. They look like they're unencumbered by past stuff. And so you start identifying the sexy in other people and you start kind of feeling it for yourself. So that kind of taps into the mirror neuron things. It's like we're we're using other people as models to model to us, to show us, to mirror to us the qualities that we want to enhance in ourselves. Exactly. For instance, I, I turned 50 this year. Um, Ooh, congratulations. So I, thank you. Thank you. I actually felt really great about it because look at all these great role models I have for a 50 plus, you know, first of all, yes, there's JLo and Padma Lakshmi and all these beautiful women out there, bikinis. And I was like, fuck, I don't need that stuff, but you go up <laughs> even further, right? You got Helen Mirren, who's fucking like 75 years old and is a boss. She is sexy as shit. And I started looking for women in all these other decades older than me that were just kind of displaying that behavior that I thought that's what I want to be like when I'm that age. Angela Lansbury is like 93 years old and was in fucking Mary Poppins returns. I mean, just a boss. And when I started looking at those kind of things that I saw, I go, what is the common thread? What am I seeing? And I'm seeing vitality in a later years. And that's what's sexy to me. I want to be this, the 80 year old woman that's still getting it on, probably has a vibrator collection and feels great. I don't want to be the Debbie Downer. That's like, you know, rocking in the rocking chair out front. I want to be living life. So I find these women and I start looking at them. I'm not worried about turning 50. I'm thinking 50 is fucking great. I'm looking forward to it. I rewired my brain. 50 is not old. 50 is just the start. So you, you literally rewired your brain by watching and admiring and, and using as models other women who represented yeah. what you desire. So I just want to it's like a vision one. board. Yeah, it's a vision. <laughs> I love it. And I just want to draw a live vision board. Angela Bassett. <gasps> oh my God. Angela oh, Bassett. That's my She's like 62. Board. She's like what? 62, 63. Uh, amazing oh, that's my vision board right there angela bassett <laughs> she and she looks age appropriate she's not trying to stay you know i'm 20 looking she looks like an older woman and she's gorgeous yes. and she's owning it i mean stella still has her groove and and when you start playing this game it's fun to play with your girlfriends it's fun to play with your partner is start finding them like okay this week we're going to find women in our 60s this woman we're going to find women in our 70s and it's really like betty white the woman's what a hundred years old now yeah. and she's still living life, still making fun of Ryan Reynolds. who wants to, you know, it, those kind of women are, I think are so important for us and, and for younger women that are listening, you know, women in their forties and fifties, you know, it's just, you want to have that idol kind of going up and Angela Bassett's, a, oh my gosh, she's gorgeous. So just a I, beautiful person. 
I love how something so simple can literally help us rewire our brain. So something that I focus a lot on in Tantra is re rewiring the brain through orgasm. What are your thoughts yes. on that? I think it sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds great. I mean, that is, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. We you say this, right? So, so, you know, and like begets like, it's, a, it's kind of like, you know, what we say. And so if you start having orgasms, you're going to have more orgasms and you're going to have more. I mean, it just, it starts to build on itself and you start to let go more. And then all those nasty conditioning thoughts can just melt away. Yeah. Beautiful. And then my, I may have to work with you on that one. Uh, what was that? <laughs> I, I may have to work with you on that one. That That's, sounds amazing. <laughs> so my, my understanding, this is one of the things we teach at the school and, and it's not. So yeah, there are two things. So one, and I learned this from Rahi Chan, who's a somatic uh, sexological body worker. And he described how the reason, one of the reasons why orgasm is so transformative is because at that peak of pleasure, all what he calls all three parts of the brain are involved. So he's referring to the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and then the human forebrain. So all, so, yes. the, so the, the energy of the orgasm or the experience of orgasm taps into all areas of the brain at the same time. And so you can rewire your, rewire those neural pathways throughout the entire brain. And that's why the healing is so um, profound and so, uh, transformative. And then the other yeah. thing, according to the research that I did, is that again, at that moment of orgasm, the brainwave patterns go into the delta delta uh, pattern. And in that yeah. pattern, that's where we are connected with our most universal expanded consciousness. So it's kind of like a reset for the entire brain. Is that well, and, and with Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm even going to go that the entire spinal cord is involved because when we orgasm, you know, whether it's cervical or clitoral or vaginal, the vagus nerve comes all the way down the spinal column, all the way right by the cervix. And so that orgasm then beside the contractions and that kind of beautiful, really firm kind of let go is felt all the way up the spinal cord up into the whole brain. So the entire nervous system is kind of shot with this glorious kind of electricity. I love that. Let's talk about the importance of the vagus nerve in sexuality. That's something that we really yeah. point a lot in our, in our teachings and in our practices is the vagus nerve. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, when we do anatomy in medical school, everyone's like, oh, the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve, and you really can't see it. It's an nerves are very difficult to see in the human body when we dissect bodies. So you can find all the blood vessels and you can see where everything was and you may get just a whiff of the nerve a little bit here and there, but you don't see it. So nerves are really fucking amazing, but a lot of times they're kind of like the unsung heroes. You don't really know how much they do for you. And I can make a woman pass out, literally pass out in the office if I dilate her cervix too quickly. That's how powerful that nerve is yeah. because it literally just, just in, and women will often in childbirth will often vomit. Um, they'll, they'll get very woozy and dizzy feeling because that vagus nerve is traveling all the way down by the cervix. And as soon as it expands, boom, mm -hmm. puking everywhere or, you know, happy pleasure everywhere. So the vagus nerve is really the super highway really for the entire nervous system all the way down to the genitalia. Wow. And my understanding is that the cervix is triple innervated with the hypogastric pelvic and the vagus nerve. Look at you, girl. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Got to know where Did anatomy to... is pleasure. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. The cervix is actually, and actually I was having a conversation about this today in clinic because I have a woman that's about to get a hysterectomy and she needs it for medical reasons. It's not just one that we're doing for fun. I don't like those. And so she asked me about, about sex and I said, well, I've never had a hysterectomy, but if your cervix is about to leave your body, they may be different. You may find that that is no longer that you can't have cervical orgasms if you don't have a cervix, yeah. you know, but since you need one, she has a, a endometrial uterine cancer. I said, since you need one, you know, we're going to find other ways for you to kind of fill that void. You know, we're going to do deeper clitoral, more vaginal orgasms. And, you know, when the vagina is just there as a cuff, that's all that's left behind. We can still make a lot of great kind of contractions up on that apical area of the vagina, even without the cervix and the uterus. Yeah. So as a whole section of women that really need you to come <laughs> work on their orgasms after hysterectomy. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that is such important information for all Yoni owners out there listening is that you can mm-hmm. still orgasm after hysterectomy. External clitoral, internal clitoral, all that erectile tissue is still going to be intact. And then the vagina itself is an orgasm zone. The A spot will still be there. So you are, you're still, you're still, your vagina will still be pleasurable. And I have a lot of women that need hysterectomies that tell me it's actually more pleasurable for them because they were having so many issues with either bleeding or pain that for them, removing those organs actually allows them to feel freer. And so they actually feel better. Wow. That is huge. That is huge. Cause I know that such a, it can be such a painful and traumatizing experience for so many women uh, to to have to, to have to make that choice about their bodies or to make that choice and have that choice taken from them. So yes. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about masturbation and in your opinion, is that important for this rewiring process, learning to cultivate our own sexual pleasure? I think it is actually the first thing that has to happen is that we have to be comfortable with masturbation. Masturbation. I mean, it's like nature's greatest gift. You can pleasure yourself with no one else. And whether you choose to use your hands, a vibrator, a dildo, whatever you're choosing to use, that masturbation is the first, like it's the first level on the video game. You got to get past that level because that's where a lot of our debilitating beliefs come from is that masturbation is a problem. And the average woman can masturbate and orgasm in three minutes or less. Men can do it in two minutes or less, but you know, it's a lot easier for them. So what are your thoughts on that? So, cause, cause I I've heard that statistic and I've had three minute orgasms and that's not something that we yeah. typically teach because usually like, so we know that the internal erectile tissue can take 20 to 45 minutes to be fully engorged. So the quality of your orgasm is going to be so much different if you have a full erection versus if you go off in three minutes. So I think like absolutely just started is great, but I also want to share, like, take your time and enjoy. And like the orgasm, the quality of orgasm that you get at three minutes in is going to be so different than the quality of orgasm that you get 30 minutes in. Yeah. It's just like, if you're having a quickie, before work with your partner versus a nice prolonged, you know, evening of passionate lovemaking. It's the same thing. And sometimes a quickie masturbation is great. If you're just like, I got to get to work. I got to, I, I got to get release the stress from the day. Great. Do the quickie. But otherwise taking your time with yourself is a great, great gift to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to me, that's part of what helps rewire that cultural conditioning, because again, good girls don't take time playing with their vaginas. Don't take time. And, and you, there's a whole area you just described, you know, the A spot, vaginal, all these different things that you're going to be more comfortable dealing with on your own before a partner. A lot of women are very hesitant to let their partner explore all those areas, but you're doing it yourself first. It's a very safe place to start. And then every time you orgasm, you're getting rid of those old beliefs. Wow. Every time we orgasm, we're getting rid of those old beliefs. That's that, that's like, that's, that's activism. (laughs) Yeah, activism. A big O for the win, right? Like, I mean, it's it's healthy. I mean, it's totally. It's a great health benefit. It just, I mean, especially with the last year, it relieves stress. I mean, it lowers blood pressure. I mean, masturbation and orgasm together, and it's okay if you don't orgasm. Of course, if you just want to masturbate without going to orgasm, that's totally fine because it's about the journey, right? It's about the 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 scenic drive. It's not always about just flying there and landing. You know, you want to see the mountains and the rivers and all that. So I always tell them, if you don't orgasm, no big deal. No big deal. Right. You, you got, you got some blood flow going down there that keeps that area really healthy, especially as we get closer to menopause, when that gets dry, getting constant blood flow to the vagina just makes it happy, healthy, fat and juicy, which is what you want. It will exactly. And that is such a key thing. So for menopausal women, I just want to tease this out and reiterate this cultivating your sexual pleasure is part of the antidote to your vaginal dryness. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those little parabasal cells kind of shrink up, right? We don't have as much collagen. And so the way that you can get more blood flow to that area is by bringing it there yourself. And then when you do that, boom, you know, your body starts making more natural lubricant. The area is pink, you know, cause you want that area to be wrinkly, fat, juicy, and pink. And then we hit menopause, it becomes pale, not stretchy, thin, 
it's kind of like the reverse of what we want with our bodies. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so if we can get the blood flow going, you don't need hormones. If you don't, if you don't want to take hormones, you're just kind of recultivating all that for yourself. So I'm loving, you are like one of the very few doctors that I've encountered that is like anti just throwing a pill at you. Cause a couple of times you said, you know, uh, have orgasms instead of Lexapro. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and, 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 and masturbate instead of hormones. Right. So yeah, like, yeah. that's profound. That's huge in terms of like the Western medical view of sexuality. They normally just want to throw pills at us as opposed to cultivating and generating our own chemicals. Yeah. I mean, I always tell women it's a little bit more work, right? You're doing, it's like a DIY project for your house. You're not hiring contractors. You're doing it yourself, but the work is going to be so much more amazing for you because you built that. So if you can, if you can rejuvenate your own vagina and if you can get off all of your, you know, depression meds, because you've created that for yourself, it's even more rewarding, which is again, better for your brain. Yeah. A little and dopamine so hit from the brain. Just want to say that we're not actually encouraging people to go off their medication. If you are on medication, we're just saying that they're also <laughs> you have lots of orgasms and see what happens. See how your mood improves. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Don't stop medications without, you know, talking to your provider first. Just want to put that little thing in there so we don't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, I'm loving what you're sharing about like masturbation and for us Yoni owners, a reclamation. Do you have any tips? And I'm sure you see this in your office for like we were talking about earlier, that early childhood conditioning, the anti self-pleasure, the anti-touch, like some of my clients, that's been really severe and they really yeah. struggle with feeling safe in their bodies to even attempt to start pleasuring themselves, much less even have an orgasm. So when you have clients that maybe struggle with those same types of, of, of traumas, what do you recommend as a way to just start easing themselves in, in guiding themselves in that direction? Yeah, this, there's not a lot of medical research on this, right? So, so what I recommended to women, and I still do, is something called infant massage. Okay. Infant massage is what we do to babies when babies are born, and we lay them on the bed, and we rub their arms and we rub their little hands and we rub their tummies and we rub their backs and we rub their legs. And we do this usually in a very methodical manner. New moms love this, right? That's bonding with their baby. And it's very safe, right? You're not doing a sexual massage on your baby. That would be horribly creepy. And so what I'll tell my women is don't touch anything that's sexual, no erogenous zones just start working on your own infant massage. So I have them literally just lay down the bed, massage arms, massage legs, bellies, backs, anything that's a safe touch. And we'll start with that because infant massage in and of itself, Dr. Spock's been talking about the benefits of it for years. I mean, all the pediatricians love it. It creates that oxytocin. It creates the dopamine. It creates all that an orgasm does just in smaller quantities. Mm -hmm. So if I can get a woman comfortable with her own infant massage, we can then lead up slowly to then touching the areas that don't feel as comfortable to start with. And that's how I get my women then to then go into masturbation. Because if I tell a woman, hey, go masturbate, and she's not, that's been conditioned out of her. She's just going to freak out. I'm going to trigger a fight or flight in her, you know, a lot of adrenaline, more trauma, and she's going to run away. She's never going to see anybody again. She'll probably never bring it up to anyone ever again. So, but if we do it very safely, like I don't want you to touch down there. Don't touch down there at all. Mm. Just focus on these parts, these parts that are safe. It automatically creates a safe place for her to go that then can then lead to, Hey, this is okay. Now let me focus on this. I love that. That that uh, that's bringing to mind something about uh, that I heard a strategy that I heard in uh, healing developmental trauma, which is creating an oasis of safety. So by touching, yeah. hey, I just want to like give a shout out for touching areas of your body that are not the genitals. Just love it on yeah. yourself like that. <laughs> like, I mean, how often do we ever do that? We let other people touch us, but yeah. how often do we touch our own bodies in a non-sexual way just for connection and comfort and love? Like that's beautiful right. of itself, but then creating this anchor, or as they say, this oasis of safe touch that we can then start to explore some riskier touch, some areas, but we always have this safe home base to return to. That's just absolutely yeah. brilliant. 
Yeah. yeah. And it can take, it can take a long time sometimes, but you're still getting all the great benefits just in smaller amounts of orgasm. But, but it's, it could be take a woman a year to do that. It could take yeah. her a few months. It could take her a week. Yeah. So, so we never know exactly how deep that's going to go, but then moving at her own pace then mm-hmm. with some encouragement mm-hmm. to, okay, what do you feel now about doing this? And, and if you have a willing partner, a very safe partner, they can do some of this for you too. But the rules are no sexual touch. And a lot of partners want to, you know, massage is foreplay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, not always. Yeah. So it would have to really be a safe moment where this is definitely not considered foreplay. This is just literally just infant massage. Yeah. Wow. And I can also see just how valuable that is in terms of trauma survivors who've had their choice taken away from them in terms of what kind yes. of touch they want to receive. Right. And so I'm just getting yes. this vision of this, of this woman just taking her time and moving at her own pace, which so often we haven't had the ability to do, whether it's in terms of our sexuality, right. our lifestyle, our work, our, you know, our career, our family, very often our choices overridden. So what a huge yes. recl- reclamation it is to just yes. move at our own pace and, and touch ourselves for the purpose of giving ourselves love. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. All right. That's wonderful homework. I'm assigning it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're so inclined, this infant massage on yourself, no genital, this is, we're going to reframe section that's no <laughs> genital touch. This is an aberration. We'll never tell you this again, but I love that. I love that. Just that safe exploration. Yeah. 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 You can use any baby lotion you want. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So what else about the brain and orgasm and, and how we can work with the brain and understanding what gets in the way to open up and awaken and expand our experience of pleasure, not just during sex, but in every area of our life. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I mean, like I said, one of the biggest things is that, and I've done this myself where I'm just, I'm first of all, I kind of got I'll say talked into sex that day. I didn't really want to, but I was like, eh, sure. I'll maybe I'll, you know, cause a lot of times women, we get, we get ex- aroused after the show starts, yeah. you know, we're not really wanting to see the movie, but once we get into the movie, we really like the movie. And so you start there, but then, you know, you're just out of it. Still, the brain's still ticking. You're thinking I got to pick the kids up at soccer tomorrow. And I got this. And so it's okay to just stop for a second. Mm. I know horrible thing to say stop sex for a minute and just rewrite yourself for a moment do the do the mirror breathing for a moment so i just need to reconnect for a second i have women that will keep a beautiful scent one of their favorite scents like in a candle or something by their nightstand and just grab it and just smell and just taking that big breath and releasing it but it's okay to stop i'd rather a woman stop sex for the moment rewrite yeah. try to get back in her limbic system than to keep going and getting those little micro traumas kind of, well, well, I did it. And that kind of sucked. I didn't, nothing happened or it didn't feel that great or it hurt, Mm -hmm. you know, and we want to know those moments. So it's okay to stop and say, I need a moment to reconnect. Let's breathe together or let me smell something or satin sheets, touch something, get into those five senses Mm -hmm. because that's, what's going to take you on the journey represence yeah so our senses are literally the gateway back to our bodies yeah it's mindfulness in its purest form yeah exactly. and so if you can just kind of and that's the quickest way to do it scent is one of the best ones because it really stimulates all those olfactory nerves and it goes straight up into the brain you know men we always say are visual creatures right they like to look to see things. That's why porn and, and Playboy and all those kind of things are very prevalent. Women are very audio based. We like to hear things. Mm -hmm. So ask your partner to talk to you. Hey, just talk to me. Start listening to their voice, not thinking why they say that. That was stupid. Why would you do that? No, I'm not going to do that. Don't think about how goofy it sounds. Just go with it. Yeah. And maybe what having them say words of appreciation, because we love those how beautiful we are, how good we feel, how good we smell. So really counteracting some of those internal messages of like, oh, I smell bad, taste bad. You know, I don't look good, whatever. So having a partner share with us, wow, you're so beautiful. And I love the way you feel. And I love the way you smell. So those words of affirmation are going to heal as well. And the words of affirmation are really key, right? Because if we're not used to hearing those, we, our brain may even trick us and actually try to say, oh, you're saying that I'm not that. So 
you're going to have to hear those sometimes multiple and just accept that that's their feelings about you and what someone else thinks about you is none of your business, right? So if they say that, you just accept, you just accept because women, we're not good at receiving. So just receive it, receive the compliment. Yeah. Emily Nagoski talks, I think Dr. Emily Nagoski talks about how um, women's, typically women's sexual desire is responsive. So we're responding. So it's not just like we're walking around like with an itch between our thighs. So sometimes that is the case. So I don't want to discount that either. But in the turn, like what you were describing, which is like, we may not really be into it initially because we're, res- we're, we're responsive. We don't necessarily have to be into it for us to then get into it once it's begun kind of thing. So, right. right. Um, so yeah, and, that's really and cool. women, women biologically have a higher sex drive than men. Like that is biologically, we have a higher sex drive than men. It has been beaten out of us by a patriarchy for a thousand years back when we had to wear chastity belts and kings could have multiple mistresses, but queens had to be chased. So we actually are programmed to be, we're the ones that can have multiple orgasms. We're the ones that can, can really use our bodies for all that pleasure. Men are really there to have their moment orgasm and they're done. You could wow. say net. No, 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 not, not in my world. No, not, not, not with your world. Immature, not with your world. Immature male. Sex. Amateur. Immature. Yes. Agreed the amateur. Yes. Yes. And so, and so I love it. I know I tell that to women, they're shocked. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you are biologically programmed to have a higher sex drive. You have to drive the species. So you have to have a sex. We've just been so good at pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down. I mean, eons, generations. Wow. And talk about the impact of intergenerational trauma that right there, yeah. low libido, having our libidos, having our natural sexual vitality suppressed by society for thousands of years has led so many women to believe that, oh, I just don't have much of a sex drive. Yeah. 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 Wow. That is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. And yes, so men can, I, my, my husband, I will say it many times and many of the male partners I've had are a testament. They have more orgasms than I do. And I'm highly orgasmic. <laughs> <laughs> call this woman call this woman if your man's only having one she needs to be involved in your life <laughs> and you know i always feel bad i feel bad because you know the, the men really we kind of give them the short end of the stick right we don't always i mean you know there's not someone like me for the guys that really is working on the sexual health side but they have just the same issues they have the exact same problem my husband was molested as a child and he had a lot of issues around that that he didn't even find out till he was in his in his 40s yeah. and so sometimes they can come right so the guys suffer a lot like the women do but of course i see women as patients and so i'm always like come on guys let's fix you too <laughs> so i'm always trying to got, drag the men along for the ride but it's the exact same thing the cultural beliefs sometimes even worse because they actually you know get derided if they're not prolific sex yeah. givers, you know, if they're not, you know, popping cherries, as we say, by the time they're 13 or 14, you know, yeah. you know, getting, getting laid, you know, like the movies Grease and those kind of things where yeah. the guys had to go out and, and, and prove their manlyhood. And so they just get it from a different angle, but yeah. Yeah. But they're suffering too. And that is such an important piece of the conversation. So that's why we're like, there's no man bashing. It's, it's recognizing that as a human, as a species, as a human species, we have all been negatively and detrimentally impacted by this patriarchal mindset and that it has cock blocked all of us. (laughs) It's a cock block happening guys. (laughs) That's the message. It's a one giant cock block. Yes. On earth. So let's, un- let's unblock that cock <laughs> and release those orgasms release it release and heal, it. Our, and heal- brains. And heal our brains and heal it all <laughs> well thank you dr heather bartos it has been so Aww. delightful to share with you and mirror neurons together <laughs> i know my pleasure i have lots of dopamine flying right now from our talk <laughs> So where can people get a hold of you and learn more about you and your work? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at Dr. Heather Bartos, B-A-R-T-O-S. And of course I have my podcast, The Me Spot, which is a twice a week, little daily vitamin, um, kind of short little um, vlog. I'll kind of say a plog. It's a podcast blog about my thoughts about sex and these kind of things. And so that's up on Apple and Spotify. And um, I'm at drheatherbartos.com. 
Yay. Awesome. So thank you, everyone. Go ahead and check out Dr. Heather Bartos on all those networks and outlets. We're on Spotify, too. Woo, woo, woo. Love it. Spotify. Spotify. Yeah, all kinds of wonderful (laughs) sexual, delicious appetizers and treats we get to listen to. That's right. You have to look for us, but we're all there. (laughs) You have to search for us. Yes. Go and don't be afraid to use that search engine in Apple. (laughs) You will find us. I look, I do, I do check up on it. Make sure that you leave a review on iTunes for both of us, Heather and myself. uh, And make sure that you follow and subscribe to our podcast and Spotify, iTunes, tune in all the major podcast networks. And if you want to see our beautiful visages, you can go to Sex is Medicine on YouTube and you will see both Heather and I live you can see us touching our brains if you want um and Yay! make sure that you subscribe to <laughs> at authentictantra.com so you can have each episode delivered hot and fresh to your inbox every saturday morning yay thank you so much heather delight. i am so my, my pleasure my pleasure <laughs> good night everyone have a beautiful week we'll see you next week you've been listening to sex is medicine with davy ward erickson your number one resource for holistic sex education. You can listen to and subscribe to Sex is Medicine on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Just search Sex is Medicine with Davey Ward. Stay connected with me and my guests on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Authentic Tantra and learn how you can use Tantra as medicine to heal, awaken, and empower every area of your life at AuthenticTantra.com. Make sure to tune in to Sex is Medicine every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Contact Talk Radio Network. And join our watch party every Thursday evening on Facebook at Authentic Tantra. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Sex is Medicine with Davey Warren.